<laughs> Viva La Vegan! Hi, I'm Lee Chantel from VivaLaVegan.net and joining me today is Nick Pendergrast. He is one of the co-hosts, along with his partner Katie, of the political progressive podcast Australia. And you can find that at progressivepodcastaustralia.com. Hi Nick, how are you? Hey, I'm great, thanks. That's good. And not only is uh, him and Katie um, co-hosts, but they're also animal rights advocates, and they're on the Committee of Animal Rights Advocates in Perth, and that website is ara.org.au, and they also run the veganperth.org.au website. So just a few things there, Nick. Yeah, 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 it's got a bit, a bit to do. I've got an endless to-do list which never seems to quite come to an end, but, <laughs> yeah, but uh, I, I try. <laughs> it's always the way, isn't it, when you do yeah. a lot of um, political and activist stuff? Yeah, there's always more work to be done for sure. <laughs> and what are you working on at the moment? Um, I guess at the moment I'm doing at the moment doing a lot of vegan stuff at the moment, like sending out vegan starter packs and those kind of things because we've had... Yeah, with Animal Rights Advocates, we've had a lot of people kind of leave the committee because they got work or they're traveling overseas. And so, yeah, we're kind of just trying to get by at the moment, just kind of keep the vegan outreach and get starter packs out and keep the website up to date and those kind of things. And hopefully down the track, we'll get back into doing some big events again. But at the moment, we're kind of just staying away from that and just kind of keeping things going, but still doing a little bit of vegan outreach. Mm -hmm, cool. And when you're talking about big events, um, you um, organised with um, probably the rest of your committee, the Cruelty Free Festival in Perth. Yep, that's right. Yep. And um, tell, so, how long was that happening? Um, it happened about, I think it was around about four years in a row, mm -hmm. um, at, in, including last year. Um, we don't have plans for one this year again because we've had kind of, kind of really small on people. So I'm going to try and build things up again and hopefully in the future we'll get it going again. But yeah, we had that for about four years, got four years in a row. And yeah, the last one was run not so much by me and Katie, but uh, by Jen and Nadia, also from ARA. But um, yeah, I helped out a bit and, and gave talks on the day and those kind of things as well. And um, I've always wanted to go there, but it's always on the same weekend as the Cruelty Free Festival in Sydney, so I'm normally always there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, a few people make the uh, make the trips to a whole bunch of Cruelty Free Festivals I've heard of, but yeah, sometimes it doesn't allow for that with the times, I guess. No, and you had, I think, was it last year that you did it earlier in the year as well? We did. It was in uh, March, but I think it was about, it was, yeah, first of March, which we thought would be okay, but it was about, uh, I think it was around about 40 degrees or something. So, yeah, yeah it, was, it was pretty warm. <laughs> a bit too hot. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And you've been involved with a lot of other social justice issues, um, such as Occupy, Refugee Rights, Workers' Rights. Um, do you find that they all intersect, or do you have a favourite, or...? Um, I probably would say I'm most informed on animal issues just because I've done my PhD on, on that topic. So it's definitely the thing I've done the most reading on. But uh, yeah, I definitely feel that they're all connected. And yeah, if I'm going to a, uh, a rally for justice for Palestine, for example, I don't feel like, oh, no, I should be doing vegan outreach or, or vice versa. It's just I feel like it's all... It's all good work. It's all important work that needs to be done. And that's why I like doing the, the podcast as well. And I do radio work here in Perth as well with indie media. Uh, and, and I like the fact that we cover animal rights issues, uh, but also, yeah, as you said, refugee issues, worker issues, lots of different issues. And I think it, it keeps things fresh as well because we're constantly going over new issues. And I mentioned the endless to-do list. And <laughs> it, does, it does have its downsides as well because... When you're covering animal issues, there's so much to cover when you're covering animal issues and sort of 20 or 30 other issues as well in the one podcast. Um, I've got an end, endless to-do list of podcast episodes <laughs> to do as well. So it does have its downsides. But, yeah, it really um, it keeps it really fresh and interesting for me. Um, yeah, one week on the radio show, the podcast, I'll be talking about uh, animal rights and then feminism and then workers' rights and Palestine and, and so many different issues. So, yeah, I find that really interesting. I just find all of these causes so important. I don't really see... One is more important than the other. I think they're all really important. And do you find you get the most interaction from anyone in particular? 
Uh, do you mean in these different groups, you mean? Yeah. They're kind of different causes working together? Yeah, I think probably the, the, the most experiences, I've, oh, probably a couple I'd mention, uh, certainly the Occupy movement, we did try and bring in an animal rights uh, message to the Occupy movement. So we were involved in the Occupy Perth movement from the start, particularly Katie as a um, law student, a lawyer now, um, she helped out the legal kind of things and letting people know their legal rights when protesting and these kind of things. So we we're both involved right from the start just mm -hmm. because we were supportive of the Occupy movement. But I think because of that, we were, you know, people knew we were animal rights advocates and said, I'll oh, bring your stall stuff down. So we often had, you know, animal rights stalls there alongside other Occupy stalls like refugee rights groups and mm -hmm. socialist groups and a wide range of other groups. Um, and also I s spoke a, a few times at Occupy as well. I was invited to speak on animal, animal rights issues at Occupy, which I, th I know that happened at other Occupiers as well, but I think it was fairly unique. It definitely wasn't a huge part of the Occupy movement, so that, that was great to have that opportunity. Uh, and also our cruelty-free festival, we tried to do that as well, particularly at the last festival we had a... Um, we had a discussion uh, which featured me talking about animal rights issues. We also had a, a refugee advocate talking on refugee issues. And we also had someone from Sea Shepherd talking about environmental issues. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, all, all three of us were basically all supportive of human rights issues, animal rights issues and environmental issues. And, cool. and the discussion was all about bringing those together. And I think that... I think it was quite good because I thought the refugee stuff was quite well received by the animal advocates. And I think the people who were there from refugee groups were also quite receptive to the animal message, particularly because the person we invited to speak from the refugee group was also very supportive of animals and animal rights as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I find it really interesting when people are only like quite maybe narrow-minded and just on one topic and they don't maybe necessarily open their minds to other things or see how things are interconnected or how yeah you can market something to another one of those areas like you said with the refugees the um, person she was open to the animal rights stuff and there's so many things that you can find similarities with I find yeah, totally. I think there are so many connections and I think, you know, when you're against, I mean, obviously there's so many different reasons why I'm vegan, but you know, one of them is, is just like an opposition to unnecessary hierarchies in, in society. So we have all these unnecessary hierarchies ever all, all around us, like, yeah. you know, men over women when it comes to, you know, gender pay gap and harassment and so many issues. And obviously I'm against that and then obviously racism there's so many others and you know the, I have the same logic towards animals as well we, we put ourselves above animals and just feel entitled to animals mm -hmm. uh, you know their, their products and their bodies and everything else uh, for no there's no valid there's no rational reason but it just comes back to that you know entitlement and hierarchy and so taking that same logic you know and applying that to feminism and anti-racism and and all these other issues it's like if I'm if I'm going to take that position on animals then it also makes sense to apply it to these other issues and be concerned about these other issues as well yeah definitely I remember the first time when I met someone who um, was not he he wasn't open to the um, the feminist sort of stuff or he was like quite um, passionate about PETA, the People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals, and I was just saying a few things to him and he just didn't get it and I found it really a bit, um, I guess it was a bit sad to find that there's people that maybe don't agree with everything that you agree with because like you said, you know, you you want to you um, believe in veganism for those reasons that you said and then it also links to other things and then it's a bit hard when you meet other vegans who you think oh I'm gonna have everything common with these people <laughs> and then when you realize maybe you don't and maybe um, you have a few um, issues that you disagree with quite strongly that's always a bit sad I find <laughs> Yeah, that's right. And I was listening to one of your recent podcast episodes and talking about, you know, infighting in, in vegan groups. And, and like you, I, I stay away from them um, for the same reasons because I feel like they can. I mean, not to say there isn't good stuff happening in these groups. I'm, I'm sure there is, but I feel like they're, they're very time consuming Definitely. and sometimes that energy could be uh, spent better elsewhere when people get in these really long arguments when only the two people arguing and the only ones looking at it. Um, <laughs> and yeah. I think you only need to spend a couple of minutes in a vegan group to see that vegans definitely don't agree on anything, don't agree on everything um, at all. And, and yeah, sometimes there is that idea of, yeah, the fact that uh, as vegans, we're kind of critical of the mainstream and trying to 
question these things but at the same time we also can't assume that because people have questioned things around animals which again is, is a positive thing that they've necessarily you know made these same um critical decisions around um you know feminism and, and male privilege and white privilege and all these other things they haven't necessarily looked at these other issues in, in a critical way and mm. Yeah, I was interviewing um, someone called Nati from Big Sky Sanctuary in Melbourne recently on our podcast, mm-hmm. and she was talking about the way in which a lot of people are not uh, necessarily being sexist, like uh, body shaming or fat shaming, for example, mm-hmm. for the sake of animals and saying, like, uh, generally, I'd be against fat shaming, but we need to do it for the sake of animals. It's the fact that they've never questioned that and seen that as wrong. So mm-hmm. um, look in the fact that, yeah, people have questioned one issue as vegans uh, but not everyone takes a further step and applies that to other issues as well takes that t- same kind of critical stance on other issues yeah definitely and it's inter- and I think it's really important that people do ask questions all the time whether or not you've been in, a, in, in whatever movement for one month or ten, 10 years it's always good to start conversations about something that you maybe aren't 100% comfortable with yeah, definitely. Yeah, I found myself being around this issue for so many years, and I've kind of, yeah, like like jumped around in terms of different positions and ideologies and those kind of things. And I think some people might see that as some kind of, you know, a sign of weakness almost. The fact that you were doing something and maybe now you wouldn't do do that now. Um, in the past, I've handed out, um, you know stuff promoting free range meat for example I wouldn't do that anymore but I I kind of don't really see it as a sign of weakness but I think it is important uh, without going down that kind of infighting road and spending all our time just arguing with each other over tactics but I I do think it is important to constantly like reevaluate ourselves and and not just be critical of what others are doing but also be critical of what you're doing and and is it effective and are there better things you could be doing and those kind of things and yeah I have yeah tried as much as I can um yeah, tried to do that over the years and being honest about what I've done and whether it's been effective or not and whether it's mm-hmm. what I'm comfortable doing and, and all these kind of things. Um, so, yeah, I think we definitely need more more critical discussion. Uh, but, yeah, I think there is definitely a fine line between yeah having that critical discussion, which is good, and then infighting. And it, it mm-hmm. is definitely hard to, to, hard to work out, you know, what, what is one and what is another in, in those cases. Yeah, exactly. I think it just all comes down to communication and communicating in a in a civil way (laughs) yeah totally yeah yeah so you completed your phd in sociology on um animal advocacy movement um can you tell me what does that mean all right well basically what i did is uh without kind of getting too academic and turn into a lecture (laughs) but basically what i did was i i used a bunch of theories from sociology around social movements and organizations so the theories i was using aren't anything new that nothing that i really came up with or anything like that these are theories that are already exist in sociology but i applied them to the animal movement which Mm -hmm. hasn't been done too much certainly has been done and has been increasingly done there is a growing kind of move but generally sociology is basically the study of people so obviously that excludes non-human animals but I was certainly still within that framework, I guess, because I'm looking at the animal advocacy movement, which is made of people. Mm-hmm. Um, so it is still studying people, but I guess bringing animals into that that framework and and sociology does have a, a definitely a tradition of being very critical, uh, very kind of um, left wing, I guess, and, and very progressive in terms of challenging sexism and racism and homophobia, all these things, and I guess just trying to bring in an, an anti speciesist message into that as well. Uh, I guess in in a nutshell, what my thesis looked at, I looked at so many different issues, but I guess the overriding theme was looking at the way in which uh, different campaigns are consistent with different forms of organisations. Mm-hmm. Um, so what one thing I noticed, for example, when I was doing my interviews, I interviewed larger groups, smaller groups and those kind of things. And it was actually kind of just being in person and just kind of clicking the fact like, oh, I'm doing this interview at this person's house or I'm I'm meeting this person at my hotel or something and then this other organisation, I'm meeting them at this big five-storey office Mm. and then thinking about these different different financial characteristics of these organisations in terms of do they have paid staff and do they have an office space, these kind of things and looking at why that's the case and looking into which campaigns they run and these kind of things. So, again, there was so much to it, but I guess the overriding theme was rather than looking at you know which campaigns were best i guess because that would be more philosophy which is not my area mm. um 
not so much looking at what campaigns are best, but looking at the way in which different campaigns result in different kinds of organisations. So in a nutshell, I guess, more moderate campaigns, which are kind of, you know, more appeasing to the public, like maybe campaigns, for example, uh, pointing out abuses happening in other countries. So mm. a, a campaign in a Western country calling out people in China for eating dogs or something is a fairly safe message yeah. that most people would get on board it with. Yeah. Uh, in contrast, promoting a vegan message is, mm. um, yeah, it's not within the dominant framework. Most people aren't vegan. So it's much harder to collect money. Like, can we collect money from you so we can tell you to stop doing things you're enjoying, <laughs> i.e. consuming animal products, compared to can we, can, you, can we get some money off you because we're going to target those evil Chinese people who are eating dogs, for example. So looking at the way in which, yeah, yeah I guess if, if you run campaigns um, which are in line with dominant attitudes, I have mm. most people on board, then you'll have more money, bigger organisations. If you want to promote a bigger challenge, you tend to have a smaller organisation, more grassroots, volunteer run, these kind of things. Mm -hmm. Wow, that sounds really interesting. And that, yeah, so yeah, it was interesting for a few years, but um, <laughs> yeah, I think like, like, like anything, if you do anything for too long, um, <laughs> then it does become a bit tiresome. But mm. I think I was, I'm very glad that I did this topic. I did something I was really passionate about. Cause I think, again, no matter how passionate you are about it after mm. doing it for years and years, it is gonna, you are going to get sick of it. But I think if you're doing something you weren't really passionate about, that would happen after maybe a few months. So <laughs> I was glad I was able to, um, yeah, get, get into it for at least a few years before I got to that point, which, yeah, kind of I was already there by that point. So, yeah, I was very glad I did a topic I was passionate about and, and involved in as well. I think that made it much easier. It wasn't some kind of philosophical thing. It was something yeah. that I was doing, yeah. you know, all the time through the thesis, sometimes to the detriment of the thesis, unfortunately, which is kind mm. of ironic, the fact that I was uh, <laughs> taking time away from studying the animal movement by actually being in the animal movement. But, mm. uh, yeah, it definitely did help with the motivation for sure. And you actually teach um, sociology and anthropology in Perth. Where, yep. do, where do you do that? What university? I'm at Curtin University in Bentley. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what are the subjects? Are they just the subjects that you teach or do you teach subjects from those things? Um, yeah, I, I teach specific things. So there, there's two units I've generally been teaching the last few years. And one is social and equality possibilities for change. That's all about social movements. So, uh, yeah, social movements and social change. So, yeah, in that topic, we cover a whole bunch of different uh, topics there. I definitely have a, a topic on animals. Um, I have a topic on intersectionality, which is what we kind of spoke about before, the fact that all these different things are connected and there are links between, you know, racism and animal advocacy and, you know, sexism and racism and all these different issues, they intersect together. Um, so I do a topic on that and looking at same-sex marriage and queer issues and uh, feminism and, yeah, a whole bunch of different issues. And I also teach a unit called globalisation, which is, yeah, as the unit says, about globalisation, but I... Again, bringing the animal topic, looking at animals and globalisation, um, but also looking at, yeah, refugees and um, uh, looking at feminism, sex work, and, and yeah, again, a whole, whole wide range of issues. A, a lot of the kind of stuff I cover on the podcast, again, um, yeah, a broad range of stuff, but all in line with kind of social change and social movements and social inequalities, these kind of issues. So, yeah, if you want to hear Nick speak about them, check out his progressive podcast. And also you've got quite a few articles on um, the conversation.edu.au website. Similar yeah. sort of things, I would assume. Yeah, I think a lot of the articles up on there are on animals more specifically. I do have a couple of different articles on, like, refugees and the media and other issues, but I think... Uh, because they are generally more academic articles. I've generally written more around my research interests. So, yeah, it is more animal-focused articles up on there, but there are um, a bunch of other articles as well. Cool. And um, so you're in Perth, which is in Western Australia, and could you tell us what the vegan scene's like over there? I've only been there once, so I don't know about it nowadays. Yeah, it's definitely growing a lot. Um, I guess I'll cover like the animal movement in a, in a sec, but I guess it, just in terms of like the availability of, of vegan products and, and vegan food, that's like skyrocketed just in the last few years. And yeah, from when I've become, you know, when I went vegan years ago, um, yeah, definitely, I wouldn't say it was hard, but it just wasn't as 
wasn't as mainstream. There just wasn't as many, you know, all vegan places. But also now we don't just have the vegan places, but we're seeing increasingly places do vegan menus. And, you know, like um, there's this, like a sushi place in the city and they've just got like a whole page of vegan sushi and wow. those kind of things. And so, yeah, there's just lots more sort of vegan places, but also lots more vegan friendly places and even chain stores marking vegan options and those kind of things. And yeah, it's actually kind of just from that experience that kind of became a part of my thesis, the mainstreaming mm -hmm. of veganism. I was just kind of seeing it everywhere. I think I sort of started to write about that when I just went into a, just a random burger place um, called Just Burgers in Perth. I think it might be elsewhere now as well. But I just walked in there. It was like, can I get a vegan burger maybe? And I looked up on the blackboard and it said, Just Burgers, um, Just Burgers loves vegans. And I was like, wow, that, that's pretty amazing because then I hadn't even gone out of my way to go there, just walked into the closest burger shop. So, yeah, I was kind of like, wow, this is kind of everywhere that places aren't necessarily like adopting all vegan food but it's really becoming easy for much any place you rock up to yeah increasingly there are vegan options certainly not as we're not as far as head as in places like sydney and melbourne with that but yeah it is getting easier and easier so yeah the, yeah there is a lot, lot more vegan stuff vegan stuff in the restaurants and the shops and those kind of things um in, in terms of vegan movement um, I guess, yeah, we do what we do with the uh, Vegan Perth website and sending our starter packs and our events and those kind of things. Uh, there's also, in terms of other groups here promoting veganism, uh, there's a new group being formed, Animal Liberation WA. Oh, cool. And I haven't kind of had much to do with them because um, kind of we've been pretty quiet for the last little while, but we're actually going to meet with them pretty soon and mm -hmm. talk about working together and those kind of Good. things. But from what I can tell anyway, they seem very much into promoting veganism and those kind of things. I guess they differ from us in that they do the rescues and those kind of things, which, which we actually do. We focus more on the outreach side of things, but uh, they definitely seem like um, at least one other group um, promoting veganism in one way or another in Perth. Whereas I think in the past it was kind of just us. There were other groups, like animal groups around specific issues, like live export, for example, or... Uh, maybe animal testing, but yeah, there wasn't too much vegan advocacy besides us. But um, yeah, it looks like that. Um, yeah, they're they're one new group that looks to be doing that as well. That's cool. And so, where are your favourite restaurants? Are there many restaurants? Yeah, yeah. There, there's heaps. There's heaps around. There's heaps in uh, Northbridge, which is um, basically kind of the city, but just kind of on the edge of the city. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, the, the sushi place I mentioned, the Suri Sushi. They've got the whole page of vegan sushi. That that's really great. Um, there's Utopia, which is a, a vegetarian restaurant. It's, it's basically got a standard Chinese menu, but everything's vegetarian and, and oh. most of it's vegan as well. So that's another uh, favorite Northbridge. Uh, there's Loving Hut, which is all vegan, which is good in, in Victoria Park. And they do, they do their own soft serve um, ice cream, um, which is great, and nice pies and desserts and everything. That's really great. Um, Heavenly Plate is another one that's a vegetarian place and again nearly all vegan as well and that's pretty close to me in Applecross so yeah there's lots of places around but oh. um, yeah and I heard that is it the same loving loving heart there that you just mentioned that are making mozzarella now as well the that, yeah that yeah and mozzarella is yeah, a, a vegan cheese that started here in Brisbane yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, they made their mozzarella. They also, uh, me and Katie a while ago had a commitment ceremony and yeah, there was Loving Hut who catered that and oh, cool. they, they took the ice cream machine down so we had soft serve ice cream as well. So that was cool. <laughs> that sounds great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so can you tell us about your story about how you went vegan and why? All right. Yeah, basically, I've, I've spoken a lot about intersectionality and being into these other issues. And I think that makes a lot of sense to me because I actually came to the animal issue last once I was already into all of these other issues. So once I got into that, it didn't make much sense. Oh, therefore, I don't care about human rights anymore. So, yeah, I was basically just um, around about oh, how old, I, maybe like 18 or something like that. And just getting more aware of political issues, human rights issues, environmental issues and yeah, I was very much uh, interested in, in yeah, animal rights and political and kind of left issues. And, yeah, then I just saw an animal rights stall at my uni. And I guess, you know, again, as I mentioned earlier, in terms of this, like, yeah, anti-oppression and yeah, opposing hierarchies and, yeah, opposing suffering and all these kind of things, which I was already into, I just hadn't extended that to animals. And I'd always, you know, 
treated animals well in my direct interactions with them growing up. Um, obviously, I was eating them, uh, um, but in terms of interacting with my dog and those kind of things, I was always very much against animal cruelty or any kind of harm to animals as, as most people are in our societies. Again, there's a, a disconnect when we sit down to eat generally and, and I had that like most people do. But um, I guess, yeah, I guess that both like that um, connection with animals and not wanting to do harm to animals and this kind of broader thing of being anti-oppression and anti-hierarchy, anti-exploitation, all these kind of things, those, it just made total sense with everything else I was getting into and, and believed at the time. So that was a vegan stall. I didn't go vegan right away. I went vegetarian because it seemed a bit overwhelming. But, mm. yeah, I was vegetarian for a few years, actually. But then, yeah, read, read something, actually. It was a, a quote from Peter Singer, actually. Um, Peter Singer and, G and Jeff, um, Jeff Mason, maybe, um, The Ethics of What We Eat. And I didn't actually read the whole book. I read about two pages on veganism. But um, we still include this one of our flyers today. But they kind of lay out the argument quite um, plainly, the fact that, well, most people are vegetarian because they're against the killing of, you know, what would be otherwise healthy animals. Mm. Um, but just laid out really clearly the fact that, you know, as you know, and I'm sure lots of people listening, you know, the males in these industries are killed right away and the females are killed once they're no longer um, productive, I guess, in, in industry terms, uh, well before they otherwise lived to if they were free from exploitation. So, again, I was already the idea, I don't want to kill animals, I'm a vegetarian, and I was kind of vaguely aware of that, but just putting it so simply just in a couple of paragraphs, just pointing out that inconsistency, I... Yeah, gave up eggs and dairy soon after that, and yeah, have been vegan ever since. Cool, that's great. And how long? How long ago was that? Uh, I'd say around about. I don't have a date or anything, but around about nine years. Okay, cool. Nine years and yeah, vegan. A lot, a lot has changed since then, hasn't it? <laughs> Oh, totally. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, when I, when I went vegan, yeah. I mean, again, I never really found it difficult. I more found it difficult actually just going, oh, maybe if I still have a bit of this and have a bit of that and all these kind of weird things of I won't drink cow's milk, but it's okay if it's in the chocolate for some mm. reason, all these kind of weird <laughs> rules. And I actually found that stage more difficult. It was actually mm. difficult just kind of taking the step. But then as soon as I... Yeah, as soon as I went vegan, I actually haven't found it difficult at all. It's just kind of very clear about what you eat and what you don't eat and those kind of things. But, yeah, just yeah, eating out and those kind of things, it has, has become so much easier. And I think it's just a lot more part of the mainstream consciousness as well. Like a lot of people aren't vegan themselves, but you say you're vegan and they won't look at you funny and they'll know what you're talking about and they'll know, you know, this celebrity's vegan or their brother's vegan or their friend's vegan. And I think it's become much more normalized, even though we haven't seen a, like a big spike in the number of vegans from any kind of surveys I looked at. It's kind of going back to my thesis just briefly. What I was arguing for is that, you know, it's not like there was like 1% vegans now we're at 95% mm. all of a sudden. But where there has been the biggest gains is, is this kind of normalization of the term. People know what it means and they might even know some of the arguments for it where even going back a few years, you know, vegetarian was in that position but mm. vegan was a bit more fringe and I think that's definitely changed over the last few years for sure. Yeah, that's true, definitely. Yeah, I've been um, vegan for 18 years now, like last month, uh, so it's been quite there's a lot and a lot of things that have changed over the years. And yeah, it's really great to see like you said um people know about it it's more mainstream and even in brisbane there's places that'll have vegan things or even like there's a lot more um raw foods and I think like healthy or clean eating sort of stuff i guess you could say so that, yeah, that's always a positive, I guess. I think they're, they're kind of like healthy craze. You know, there's um, like gym equipment. Every, you walk around the shops, every shop, even like that's not a gym, like they're not selling gym clothes or anything, but like there's, a you know, gym clothes out the front or Target now, there's a massive like gym clothes section. So there's kind of been this big like health craze going on mm. at the moment. And I think a lot of the times... Uh, coincidentally, uh, like it really helps out with veganism. Like at my uni, for example, we've got a really nice like green smoothie van, yeah, cool. which is a, it's not marketing itself as vegan or anything mm. like that. But I think like one of their little sweets has got a bit of honey in it. But like like ninety nine percent vegan, and mm. without even trying to, they're kind of going more of the health angle. But that just happens to intersect nicely with veganism. So the more we see, you know, green smoothies and, you know, quinoa and raw food and everything, the more we get vegan products without even people necessarily being into animal rights and, and people might be eating a lot more vegan food or drinking green smoothies or whatever without, yeah, without even necessarily doing it for the animals. But it still does have a positive effect in terms of reducing the demand for all these products. Yeah, definitely.
I wanted to ask a few questions about your podcast. Yeah. So, um, Progressive Podcast. So, um, why did you start it originally? Uh, we started it because we would always be ranting to each other about <laughs> political issues, just like for the hell of it. Just like when we got together, like we actually met at a vegan cafe. So we were both, yeah, vegan. This is you and Katie. Oh, yeah, me and Katie. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah, me and Katie, my partner who I do the podcast with, uh, we, we just, when we got together, we, um, when we kind of got together, we both um, kind of bonded over our love for the band Propagandy. I'm not sure if you've heard about them at all. They're yeah, a vegan band, but also you know, anarchists and pro-feminists and anti-racists and all, all the stuff that we believe in. So kind of that's how we kind of got together talking about a lot of these issues. And so we'd always be, yeah, again, ranting to each other about you know wide range of political, pol- political issues. And we thought, well, maybe someone else might want to hear this. So we thought we'd get a podcast going. And actually specifically what... We were thinking about it for a while, but what actually made us uh, do it was um, the, the Occupy movement here in Perth. So basically there was, um, we had the Chogham um, Commonwealth Heads of Heads of Government meeting that kind of coincided, uh, that is going back a few years now, but there was a lot of protests against that because all these leaders were here who were, uh, yeah, known for human rights abuses, for example, um, and yet, you know, it was taxpayer-funded money, putting them up in nice hotels and those kind of things. So there was a protest against that. So we had, like, a worldwide Occupy movement. But in Perth, we started about two weeks later because we already had this kind of momentum around, like, an anti chogan protest. So basically, we had an anti chogan protest, which basically, when that um, finished, that kind of started the occupation in Perth, um, okay. in terms of Occupy Perth. So, yeah, on that very first day, I did some interviews just with a little portable recorder and um, played them on the podcast Citizen Radio, which is a political podcast. They're, they're both vegan as well mm-hmm. um, and, like us, cover a wide range of issues. And, and, yeah, that got played on Citizen Radio, and that's kind of how we got started out, out, of, out of Occupy, I guess. But I should also say uh, myself listening to podcasts like Vegan Freak Radio as well was a big inspiration. Before I heard Vegan Freak Radio, which... Again, it's going back a few years. I think a lot of animal advocates uh, today have really benefited from that. Those who have been around for a few years. But, yeah, I think, yeah, really enjoyed that podcast. And until I heard Vegan Freak Raid, I didn't actually know podcasts existed. Mm. Uh, friends, oh, listen to this podcast. Like, What's a podcast? I didn't really know it. <laughs> Up until then, I'd often have, like, my mum saying, oh, there's animal rights on the radio, for example. You kind of have to tune in at specific times. And it's like now with podcasts, it's like, whatever issue you're into, you can listen to hours of it. You don't have to wait for like mm. a five minute segment on, you know, 720 radio, 810 radio national or whatever. Mm. It's like, it's just constantly stuff, um, covering these really, uh, niche, niche issues. So yeah, I guess I, guess I love vegan freak radio cause it was yeah really informative, uh, but also quite kind of a laid back kind of humorous kind of vibe as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, and yeah, I guess we kind of go for that as well. It's not like a very um, professional kind of uh, CNN kind of style podcast. It's more of a yeah conversational style podcast that does cover important stuff as well. But uh, yeah, we have music and clips from TV shows and stuff like that. So it's kind of not uh, a totally straight podcast either, which uh, I find more fun. And um, where do you host it, your podcast? Uh, we just do it from our house. We've got a home studio now. So mm-hmm. we've actually set up the desk now so we've we've kind of evolved over time from not having a microphone at all and both kind of yelling into a laptop (laughs) um internal mic the laptop then we got kind of ten dollar microphones and yeah which weren't that great we used those quite a few quite a while uh, but now we've actually got good uh studio quality microphones and we have started up like a membership as well so we get donations so that's helped cover some of that cost and stuff as well so yeah definitely um, hopefully the contents got better, but I can at least guarantee that the sound quality has better. <laughs> has got better. That's one thing I can guarantee. So, what other equipment have you got? You've got the mics. Um, um, we've got a mixer. Uh, my cousin is um, really into music. He's a musician, so we got an old mixer off him, which mm-hmm. um, is quite good. I guess I've got no idea about any of that stuff, but he assures <laughs> us it's quite good. So, yeah, we just got a mixer, um, the two mics. We got the mic stands. Um, yeah, I think that's about it. Yeah. yeah. And what yeah. Um, programs do you use to record and to edit? Um, I just use Audacity. Audacity. Yeah. And so, what you upload it to there, and you can edit there, or is that on your computer? Oh. Audacity. Well, yeah, it's on the computer, so we record and edit on Audacity. Okay, cool. And then, where do you upload it to? Like, where's where's your hosting for the podcast? It's uh, Cyber Ears. Cyber Ears. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And you and yeah. you're on quite a few 
Um, I think it was on. Was it syndic some syndicate Libsync or something? What where uh, is it hosted? Yeah. Some other. There's some other ways I saw that you were listed on. Can't remember what they were though. Yeah, I mean, we we're on Stitcher now. We do Stitcher, and mm -hmm. we often put it on archive.org or oh, Mediafire, and yeah, we put it on a bunch of different places. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But yeah, if you go to our main website, then you can find all those different ways to download them. Cool. And um, so how long, like, do you do it every week, every two weeks, or just whenever you feel like it? Yeah, no, we're very all over the place. Like, sometimes we'll, I mean, our general thing is about every two weeks, but um, we've actually been doing it a lot more frequently than that lately. So sometimes we can have two episodes in one week and then mm -hmm. go two weeks without doing one. And so, yeah, it really depends. Um yeah, what's going on in the world and how much time we've got with teaching and marking and Katie started full-time work. So, yeah, kind of, uh, yeah, sometimes I do episodes with other people now and those kind of things. So, yeah, it depends. Yeah, it's very, it's it's not reliable and all, all over the place. But I'd say on average lately we've probably done them uh, every maybe week and a half on average. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, it's definitely not a standard ske schedule at all. And did you have a favourite person that you've interviewed or a favourite topic you like to speak about? Um, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll mention one episode. This is going back a while. Episode 35, I think it was. We interviewed mm -hmm. Kirsten Bays over in London. And, and we were in... I'm trying to think. It was all like a lot of weird circumstances that happened. But basically, we did an episode on uh, Chelsea Manning, um, who, you know, through the WikiLeaks, did the WikiLeaks and those kind of things, um, leaked the information. We did an episode on that. And then we just, we were talking about queer issues and trans issues and these kind of things. And then we talk about um, a mainstream sort of gay and lesbian group who were actually promoting a weapons company. And talking about, you know, that a lot of the sort of more mainstream queer organisations haven't been too supportive of Chelsea Manning or haven't spoken out too much mm -hmm. because um, she is a trans woman mm -hmm. and, you know, doesn't fit maybe, you know, a, the representations of a lot of people in same-sex marriage ads, for example, who tend to be cisgendered white males typically. And so... Yeah, it kind of. We just briefly touched on that for about two minutes, and then we went to London right after that episode. And someone got in touch uh, from the group Stop the Arms Fair, and they protest arm fairs. And so, uh, and that that was Kirsten, Kirsten Bays. And so we met her in London, and she happened to be vegan as well. So we oh. met at um, somewhere called um, Miss Cupcake, I think it was in London. Um, Miss Cupcake. Yeah, is yeah. that right, Miss Cupcake? Yeah. And they had the best Ferrero share cupcakes. So we yeah, we um we met with her and had like yeah, vegan food, had cupcakes and then yeah, really amazing interviews. Went down the road and interviewed her in London and yeah, and yeah, had a really great interview and yeah, her insights into the arm industry are really interesting and she also linked it back to animal issues and yeah, we had a long chat afterwards about, you know, animal rights and stuff as well. So yeah, that was just a really great like chance thing of yeah, someone in the UK happened to hear our podcast and then we were over there and mm. yeah, she got in touch with us. So it was kind of a chance interview, but yeah, I, yeah, she was really great. So yeah, that was one of my favorites. Yeah, that's always good when that happens, isn't it? The universe yeah. just makes everything sort of set in the same place at the same yeah, time. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so if you want to hear that podcast that Nick's just been speaking of, or if you'd like to catch up on all the other podcasts that Nick and his partner Katie have done, make sure you check out ProgressivePodcastAustralia.com and also see Animal Rights Advocates, ARA.org.au and VeganPerth.org.au. Thank you very much for joining us today, Nick. Oh, thanks, it's been great fun. Thanks for having me. has been good. And I'll see you next time on this um, interview. And you can see VivaLaVegan.net for more interviews with inspiring vegans. Thank you.